This section is all about security and scalability. So first we're gonna go ahead and implement a load balancer. This allows us to scale up our services to handle additional load. Now, what that means is we can actually scale any given server either vertically, which means make it bigger, add more RAM to it, or more disk space, or horizontally, which means just add more servers. Now, Nginx actually handles this for us, and it's really great because it helps us scale up our application without really killing the bank, which is really nice. The other side of this is actually securing our whole service by having both a custom domain and HTTPS. Now we're gonna be implementing that with Let's Encrypt and Nginx. Both things are really, really easy to do, as you'll see. So let's go ahead and jump in. One of the biggest benefits of scaling horizontally is to implement load balancers. Now what's great about this is we can actually spread our traffic across different application servers. So this is actually really cool, but it also means that if one of our application servers goes down, that our entire service doesn't necessarily go down with it. So let's go ahead and implement one now by creating a brand new Linode for it. So we're gonna select Fremont, select Nanode one gig, and I'll go ahead and just call this Nginx load balancer. And we'll use Nginx as a tag and maybe our freelance job ABC. And then our root password, I'll just go ahead and stick with the one I've been using, which is this one right here. And there we go. And then I'm gonna use my SSH keys and we'll go ahead and create that. So while that's being created, I'm actually gonna jump back into my folder for Nginx and call it my lb.conf. And this Nginx configuration is actually identical or very close to identical to my original configuration for Nginx. We still have that proxy in here, but now instead of using a local host as our server, what do you think we're gonna use? Well, if we go back into our Linode console and grab our application server IP address and paste that in there. It's really that simple. And so we will expand on this in just a moment, but for now I wanna actually set up my load balancer to make sure it works with even just one application server. So we're gonna go and copy this. And I wanna SSH in there. Go ahead and say yes. I shouldn't get a password because I added that SSH key. And so now we'll go ahead and do sudo apt update, yes. And then of course I'm gonna actually install Nginx. So sudo apt install Nginx and yes. And so while that's installing, I'm gonna go ahead and open up that IP address. And by the time we get here, Nginx is already going. Okay, great, so that's a good sign. So now what I wanna do is I want to actually update the configuration to just this. Now you may recall the configuration is in CD ETC Nginx and sites available and default, All right? But I'm gonna just CD into sites available and default is in there. Now this is enabled by default as well. So if we go to sites enabled, it's the same file. So just keep that in mind. We don't need to change much. I mean, you can keep it if you want, but uh, I'm gonna just change it. So let's see, CD back to sites available. And we'll do sudo nano default, okay? So again, I'm not gonna keep any of this. I'm just gonna get rid of all of it. And we're just gonna copy and paste this configuration. Now, Linode and Nginx do work hand in hand, no problem, right? Of course, but Nginx itself has a lot more configuration that we're just not gonna touch for simplicity purposes. By all means, check out the Linode documentation more. So anyways, I'm gonna go ahead and say yes and save. And so I've got my proxy in here still, it's going, forwarding on to that original server. And so with that, I now just need to reload my system, which is just sudo systemctl reload nginx, and I refresh an nginx, and now it's saying hello world from Jenja. Now this actually isn't surprising at all to me because, well, our application server is loading on our index page. It's loading that index.debian.html. 
Well, we also have this ABC route, which we can test out with ABC. Cool. So this doesn't feel like a load balancer just yet. And that's because it's not. It only has one application server. But we've implemented at least the fundamentals of getting that ready, which means we just need to duplicate the server IDs or IP addresses right there. So I'll go ahead and leave nano default open. So let's go ahead and open this up. And now I wanna actually add in a, another server, right? And to do this, I'm gonna go ahead and clone my original application server. Before I clone it, I'm gonna come in here and rename it. The old name no longer works for me. So I'll go ahead and say app server one, or really web app server one. So I'll go ahead and copy that and we'll save it. Now let's go ahead and duplicate this with a clone call and same region, same nanode, and now it's gonna be web app server and two, and hit create Linode, okay? So we now have a new IP address. I'm gonna go ahead and copy that one, add it in here, and we're gonna go ahead and save everything. I'm gonna reload Nginx, and now I'm gonna run Nginx. I'm gonna refresh several times. So notice that it's pending, right? So I did this really fast on purpose because this one is offline, right? So what a load balancer will do is actually run health checks on our system, on our site, right? So when it, see how it's pending, it's waiting, it's waiting. Um, it will continue to do that until it actually is running. So it's actually waiting for some sort of response from this, which it's not gonna get, it's currently offline. So I'll go ahead and power it on. And right now it's still being created so it may or may not work at all. Uh, and actually it's gonna be kind of hard to tell if it is working. So what I wanna do now is actually update my application to tell whether or not it's working. And so to do this, I'm just gonna go ahead and create a new module called ip.py. And in here, I'm just gonna copy and paste some Python code that's just gonna make it really easy for me to grab my IP with this function right here. Um, and what I'm trying to grab is this IP address here. There's no real simple way to just grab that uh, without running something like this. So in main.py, I'll go ahead and import that with from IP import get IP. And then in my template itself, I'll go ahead and pass that in as a host name. Okay, so get IP, we want to run that function. Okay, so hopefully it gives us the correct value. We'll see in a moment. And then in our actual template, which is in here, we're gonna go ahead and add dash host name. Okay, so we got our host name as our key and there we go. Okay, so before I go any further, let's go ahead and open up a virtual environment. Let me just close out a few things here. And now back into my project here, we'll go into CD app source bin slash activate and we'll run uvicorn and main colon app and dash dash reload. Okay, so I've got my server running and I come in here and there we go. Cool, so that looks like it's actually working correctly. Uh, exactly what I wanted to see as far as the function is concerned and making sure that it works on my own machine. Now I blurred out that IP address, but the idea here is you should be able to do that now too. You should have seen it. Okay, so now that I have this code changed, it's time to actually, well, we have to do git now. So back into our app, we got git status, all of these things have changed. And so the first one I need to do is I'm actually gonna send it Let's go back here to web app server one, our original server, right? So that's it right there. And so if I do git remote dash V, it shows me my original server right here too. So I'll go ahead and do git add dash dash all, git commit and added host name for load balancing or something like that. And then do git push Linode main, pushes that, should put it into production right away. And so we can verify this by going to that IP address and there it is. Look at it showing up. That's cool, right? Um, maybe, maybe not incredibly surprising, but cool nonetheless. Now I realized I just copied and pasted this code and you may have had a pause or something like that. It's also gonna be on our GitHub repo, so you could always check that out as well. 
Uh, but this is fairly straightforward code and you don't even need it. It's really just to show us that this load balancer is working. So let's go ahead and look at that. Now inside of my Linode, again, going back into my load balancer IP address, pasting that in there. Now it's showing it and then it goes away. Hmm, why did it go away? Why isn't the code the same? Well, that's of course because I now have two application servers and they aren't talking as far as Git is concerned. So what I need to do is I need to add another remote on Git. So very similar to this remote right here, we're gonna go ahead and do git add remote, and this is gonna be Linode 2, and it's almost that one, but now it's just our new IP address for our new application. And so I'm gonna go ahead and come back here, back, 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 save that in, and now go to the very end and hit enter, and git remote add, oops, I had those backwards. Let's copy that again paste that in here, and now git push Linode to main. We hit enter, and notice it's asking me this. I've never SSH'd into this app itself, so I can go ahead and say yes. And then now, if we look at our load balancer, it's gonna flip back and forth between these two. Hey, look at that, that's pretty cool. You know what, while we're doing this, let's do it again. So the same exact web server, this time it's gonna be three and create it. Okay, so grab that IP address here. Go back into our, let's see, our Nginx load balancer session. Feel free to SSH in case you left it. But let's go ahead and go into nano and go into the server, paste that in here, close it out, save it, reload Nginx, and again, this one's offline, it's not ready yet. So if I run this again, there will be one that just kind of hangs a little bit that of course is trying to get to this IP address and it will hang, but it should eventually move on to the next option. Um, now that actual speed and time is all variant in something we can configure, but it's not something I'm gonna worry about right now. Um, and so we've got this actually creating, let me just power it on for a second. I'm gonna go ahead and pause and then we'll take a look at all three. And I let it time out, but notice that the, it didn't say page not found. It never did that, right? So if I changed maybe like my IP address here, eventually it should say page not found unless of course it finds a page, but this will actually have a timeout, whereas the Nginx will not really time out on that server. It will just go to the next available op option uh, within our load balancer, uh, which I think is great. Okay, so now it's got this server. I'm actually not gonna run that. You could you could always try that out. Um, let's go back into our load balancer. And here we go. Copy that and paste in here. And there we go. So three different ones should actually show up. Uh, right now it looks like two and there's the third one, right? So it actually did a health check this time and then it actually implemented it back in here. And now we've got all of these different application servers here. So yet again, locally, when I want to push to all three of them, this is of course, one of the challenges here is I don't have a remote for this third one. So yet again, I need to just add it in as a remote. So first off is gonna be the IP address here. So let's go ahead and grab the IP address again, which is web server three, I'll copy this one, paste it in here. And this is gonna be Linode three. Okay, and hit add, cool. So the next part is, well, we actually wanna run all of these things, right? So I, I literally want to push to all of these different re remotes or these different servers at once. I don't wanna to have to actually do git push Linode and then git push Linode two and then Linode three, right? I'll say yes, there we go. So I literally want to make an alias, this is what I called, an alias to actually push to all of these. So to do that, we do git config, and then we are gonna do alias dot push all, and then I'll go ahead and call a string of git push linode main and and git push 
Linode 2, oops, Linode 2 main and, and git push Linode 3 main. And now what we'll do is after we, you know, add that alias, we just run git push all, hit enter, and now it's going to try and push it to all three of those. Now we can verify this even further by changing this from hello to nginx. We can now change this to our actual title up here. You know, perhaps that's one thing. Uh, perhaps we actually don't want this anymore, right? So perhaps it's just like hello from the awesome, awesomer LB, like load balancer. And now we'll do git status, git add dash dash all, git commit, and updated primary template, and then git put or git push all. Hit enter, and now it's going to push each one. Not all at once, but fast enough to where our load balancer will be able to handle that data, as we see here, right? So each one's changing, as well as that up there. Pretty cool. So there is other configuration things that we can consider in our load balancer, uh, but this by default is pretty much the simplest thing that we could do, okay? So let me go ahead and just bring it back up and reference the way we did it right inside of the code here so we can use it in the future. Okay, so when I say use it in the future, we can add as many servers as we wanted to on this load balancer. Um, there, there might be a limit to it, maybe it's 50, but there's definitely probably a limit to it. Uh, but the idea here is we now can scale out horizontally uh, to actually handle a lot of load coming in. Now, Linode does have a service for this called a node balancer, which is very similar to this. Uh, but I really like being able to control exactly how I configure everything and know what's going on uh, with my entire project. So as we see here now, if I turned off my original server, let's just power that off. Let's say somebody on your team accidentally did that, right? Then of course, if I come in here, my load balancer takes effect and knows about that, right? It's already happening. And so of course I'll power it back on in just a moment. Uh, the other part is if I accidentally pushed code, like the incorrect code, um, like how do I actually revert, right? So if I do git log, let's say for instance, I actually want to just leave the host name in here. Now I could revert back to this commit and then push, may do a force push, but I'd, I'd want to do it on each actual branch, right? So um, that's something I'm not going to cover right now, but that's just the general idea on how you might revert back your applications. Now, the other thing is that's really cool about this. I can power this back on, of course. Um, the other thing that's cool about this is we can actually now treat this as potentially A-B testing because of how the load balancer is going to work. It's going to go based off of load. It's not it's not perfectly A-B testing, but it allows us to actually have different versions in production for this code, right? So in theory, you could have three different servers running three different versions of the code, and the users won't necessarily know which one they're going to get. Now, of course, that is probably not the greatest idea uh, for major features, this, this method of doing it, uh, but it is a way to think about it. So yeah, there are more advanced features for load balancing, including like location-based ones as well. Uh, this is called a round robin, so it's gonna go one after the other after the other, and then go back to the top. You know, just keep doing that uh, for it forever, as long as those servers are all running. So I think this is actually really cool for handling load and also being able to scale out, you know, um, horizontally. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and implement a custom domain. And this custom domain, of course, is gonna be on our primary entry point. And hopefully you realize that's gonna be our load balancer, because of course, that's gonna redirect all of our traffic to our various web servers. Now we could put custom domains on the web servers too, but then we don't have the benefit of the load balancer. So we're gonna avoid that. So for now, I'm gonna go ahead and copy the IP address from here. And then I'm gonna go over to where I purchased my domain, but more importantly, where my domain is actually hosted. In some cases, you might actually have your domain purchased from one place and then hosted or managed in a completely separate place. And so wherever it's actually hosted and managed is where you're gonna go ahead and put in these items. 
So we're gonna be using the record type of A. This is an A record and it's gonna to point to our IP address. Now the actual host or the subdomain name is completely up to you. In my case, I'm just gonna go ahead and use Linode and that try fastapi.com. That's basically the domain name here. Um, I, I can't say for sure if this domain name will always be up, but the idea here is that we have some sort of host and you will as well. And then the other part of this is, of course, we could use www as well as an empty host here and place that in, okay? So now if I actually go to that domain name, mine shows up, right? So it's actually the load balancer and we see it actually going through the various IP addresses for the web application servers. So mine showed up right away. Yours may or may not show up right away. It could take some time to propagate. It could take 24 hours. It could take up to 72 hours before you actually see anything on your domain here. And so just keep that in mind when you're going forward. But even if it's not showing up just yet, we can still do the next part, which is actually configuring Nginx to handle this better, or at least correctly, in the sense that if I did go to the IP address that we had here, I want that to redirect to my custom domain name because eventually what we're gonna be doing is adding in security or an HTTPS certificate so that this is secure, much like Linode is, or most applications or websites you would end up using. So let's go ahead and do that now by SSHing into our load balancer. So let's grab that SSH access item here. And so hopefully you remember, we can CD into ETC, Nginx, and sites enabled. And this will give us our default here. Of course, we could have changed the name of that, but we'll just stick with the default. So we'll do sudo nano and default. Okay, so typically speaking, whenever you add a domain name in here, you're gonna to wanna to update this attribute. So it's no longer localhost, it's our actual domain name, including the subdomain. So I did linode.tryfastapi.com. You might also have www.whatever as well as nothing. So in case of tryfastapi.com, I could do both of these in here and it would actually work well. And that's how you would end up declaring that domain name for Nginx. Now this is actually really important for when we implement something called Let's Encrypt, which will allow us to have HTTPS on here, which of course is something I'm not covering just yet. So the next part of this is the redirect. Now there's uh, several different ways on how we could go about redirecting the IP address to this domain name. I'm gonna go a simple route, and that is by adding in a, another server declaration here, and yet again, listening for 80, or port 80. Port 80 is the default um, HTTP port, not HTTPS, but HTTP. So we're gonna listen at port 80, and then now I'm gonna go ahead and give the server name of the actual IP address. So let's go ahead and copy that, make sure it's copied and bring it in here. And then we'll just go ahead and return a 301, as in a redirect, along with the scheme, like HTTP or HTTPS or FTP or whatever. And then linode.tryfastapi.com. Of course, that's mine because that's what my domain name is. And then we're gonna go ahead and append the request underscore URI. And so this will give me a full on URL redirect, which we'll check in just a moment. And so I'm gonna go ahead and save this with control X, Y, and then enter. And then we'll do sudo service Nginx reload. You can do restart, but reload will not bring Nginx down. Restart will. Okay, so we reload that. And now if I go to that domain here or the IP address, it should redirect me to the domain name. Simple enough. And then if I go to, I don't know, ABC or a different path, it should redirect me to the correct path with the correct domain name, which I think is really cool. So the last part to consider here is the web servers themselves. Should we actually update the Nginx for that to kind of match what we just did? Uh, and my answer is of course, no. So if we look at here, what we don't want to have happen is my servers up here redirecting to this server name itself because of how our load balancer ends up working. So what would be better is that our firewall on each one of these servers only accepts requests 
from this particular server, right? Um, now that's getting to some complicated things that we don't need to cover. But the main thing here is we don't need to update our servers here. We can, there is a way to make it happen, but it starts to add a lot of complexities to a fairly simple and straightforward system. And the other thing is the actual server name itself, we do not have to hard code it. There is another way to do it. Again, a little bit more complex than this, right? This just makes things nice, simple, and easy. Now, of course, if you actually did want a custom subdomain on one of these servers, so like if you were testing a different version of the app, you totally could do that. And then maybe you would actually remove it from the upstream proxy, right? So the actual load balancer itself, you might remove it from there and then you would treat it just a little bit differently. So that's it for a custom domain. Now what we need to do is actually enable Let's Encrypt and get a security certificate. Now we're gonna go ahead and make sure our application is secure using CertBot and Let's Encrypt. So what this is gonna do is it's gonna allow us to have HTTPS for free in the past, you used to have to pay for HTTPS. You no longer have to do that thanks to CertBot and Let's Encrypt. So definitely check out this URL right here. And we are using Debian 11 in this case. But overall, this setup process is not really that much different for the vast majority of systems. So first and foremost, what we need to do is install SnapD. Now to do this, we're gonna go ahead and SSH into our project here. So I'm in the root of my project and I'm gonna run sudo apt update and yes. And then sudo apt install snapped D. And we're gonna go ahead and say yes. Okay, so that's gonna update that for us. And then we will also use snap D to update and refresh itself, which hopefully will really quickly. Uh, but it might take a moment or so. Okay, great. Now, the next step here is to remove old versions of CertBot. Now, you may or may not already have this in your system. In our case, we do not, right? So even running any of these commands uh, should not actually show up at all, right? It's gonna say, don't know what you're talking about. Cool, so not installed. Okay, so now we're gonna go ahead and install it with Snap. Okay, and so other guides that you may have seen don't use Snap, they can directly install CertBot itself. Uh, but in something like this, I definitely like going off of what the official recommendation is from the service that's putting it out. And so that's why we're just kind of going step by step here on getting this all set up. It's really not that big of a deal because what we end up doing is setting up Nginx. So we already set up Nginx and we already set up a domain on Nginx, right? So now it's saying, hey, do we need to get and install or just get? We need to do both. We wanna actually have it get and install our certificates for us. And it should actually look in here, right? So email address that you want for security up purposes. I'm just gonna go ahead and put in my general email address. Um, and then with the terms of services, you know, we wanna say yes. Eventually we're gonna actually probably put in our domain name, but it actually found it for us. So that's exactly why we had to put in our domain prior to jumping here is because then you wouldn't actually have a domain to, well, certify. And so in this case, I'll go ahead and select that domain name. It's going to request a certificate for me, and then it should actually implement Nginx for me as well, uh, which we could test the automatic renewal as well. That's something worth doing also, because uh, you will have to renew your certificate from time to time but I will let this actually finish requesting the certificate and then we'll come back. Okay, so what we see here is it was successful and it's gonna expire only in a few months for me, right? So it's probably gonna happen for you as well. It's only a few months, but what's cool is it set up a scheduled task to renew this automatically. So one of the things that I didn't mention prior to jumping in here is it's really important that we do this on the right server in this case, especially. Now you can do it on another server and then move it over, but it's just a manual process that is not ideal in my opinion. Uh, the other part is it's scheduled a task to automatically renew this service for us. Hey, isn't that cool? Uh, but of course we could still run that, that renew command itself and just do a dry run to see what it is that it's gonna attempt to do as far as the configuration is concerned, which shows us things about 
the configuration for Let's Encrypt. So if we look at that, we can see all of the various things related to our domain name and this certificate, which is also cool. So the next thing is actually taking a look at our Nginx. So let's go ahead and CD into that and Nginx and sites enabled. And we'll just do cat default here to just take a look at it. And so these are things that I didn't have to set up myself. So we see all this right there. This is coming through as well. Notice that it has CertBot did, uh, well, the same thing that we sort of did. Remember how I said there was other options? Well, here's that other option, which I think is great. It's actually showing me that, what do you know? It's also going to HTTPS, which is really nice. So let's go ahead and take a look at our newly secured website. What do you know? It does it automatically. So even if you try to go to HTTP, it's not gonna go there. And then of course, if we try to go to our, uh, you know, the IP address itself, it's gonna actually redirect to the secure one as well. That is incredibly simple and it's because of CertPot. Doing this manually is definitely achievable and possible, but if you were to need to move the certificates to another server, this at least gives you exactly where it's located, how you could just copy those files and the configuration and everything you might need over into that new server. Although I would probably not recommend doing that. Instead, I would just try to re get a new certificate itself, actually get it reissued and just do it that way where it's just like this all over again. Um, so that's definitely something that I think is cool, easy. And for websites that do not have this, there's literally no reason anymore as we've seen how easy it is. So yeah, if you have any issues with it, let me know. Otherwise, let's keep going.